The next two presentations are on a topic that I, anybody who's done modeling uh, will have experienced. The model calibration is often the hardest part of this whole process. And in fact, um, with stochastic models, it's particularly challenging. Uh, and delighted to have two talks that'll be tied together, in fact, uh, one more methodologically oriented, the other sort of more practically oriented, looking at some new calibration techniques applied to malaria models. So uh, first I'll pass over to Arlene, who's joining us from Swiss Tropical. So I'm going to talk about um, Bayesian optimization to calibrate indiv indiv individual based models and more specifically, um, how we use it to calibrate open malaria. So just um, if you don't know open malaria, this is an open source individual based model, uh, stochastic, so stochastic model of malaria epidemiology and control, where we simulate individual humans, but also individual infections inside each human. Uh, we also have a vector model and we simulate uh, different types of different types of drugs and many interventions. And it's available on GitHub. It's open source. You can feel free to have a look. Uh, it's a complex model. Uh, we have uh, multiple sub models. We have the infection incidence model. We have the acquisition of immunity, parasite densities, the disease model. Each of these models is regulated by um, a set of equations and these equations, they have parameters, and some of these parameters, um, it's hard to assign a value to them they are, because they are not easily observable in practice. Um, for example, it's very hard to say um, the decay rate of mater maternal immunity is 2.5. We don't know. Uh, it's something that we need to calibrate to a set of data collected from the literature and field studies. And we also need to recalibrate um, every time we add new data, which is what we were doing here, but also when we add new model features or where we also want to calibrate model variants, different set of equations. Um, in total, we have between 20 and 25 parameters to recalibrate. And to do this calibration, we need a way, given a set of parameters, um, to tell us how good a given set of parameters is. And to do this, we have this rather complicated function um, where basically we simulate many sites. And then what we do is we compare uh, the predictions from our model, open malaria, to observed data from the literature and from field studies. And we group these simulations um, by objectives. And we have one objective for prevalence, one for clinical incidence, for severe disease, parasite densities, and so on. <clears throat> In total, we have uh, 12 objectives. So we give a score this way um, by so when we compare the observed uh, the predictions from the model to the observed data, we calculate the typically the residuals uh, residual sum of squares or the sum of log likelihood, likelihood, and this way we can assign a score to each of our objectives. Because we have twelve objectives, in the end we have uh, twelve scores, but we can also go one step further and compute the weighted sum of this objective, and we end up with just one value. And so we have this rather complicated function, but in the end it's just a function. We have our 23 parameters and we have either 12 or one output. So if we take a, if we take a step back, what we want to do is actually just minimize this function to get the optimal set of parameters for our model. Now, the first and probably the biggest challenge is the curse of dimensionality. Uh, and to illustrate this, uh, let's say you have just one parameter, one dimension. Uh, to cover the entire space, you would like to do at least, let's say, um, 10 samples per dimension. Okay, so in 2D, uh, you would need to divide your 2D search space into 100 square squares and at least one sample per dimension square. In 3D, you would have, you would end up with 1,000 little cubes in your 3D search space. And with Open Malaria, we have 23 parameters. So if we follow this logic, we would need to do more samples than there are stars in the observable universe, which is a lot. Realistically, on our HPC cluster, we can only do 10,000 samples maximum, which already takes a week or so, uh, which is clearly not enough. So to have a chance um, to minimize this function and to converge somewhere, we use Bayesian optimization, which essentially helps us reduce the number of samples that we have to do to converge. Um, so initially, I had a set of fancy slides to explain the whole process, but I thought it's 
easier to explain with a step-by-step -step example on a very simple function. So to illustrate this, I chose the Akli one-dimensional function. It's only one dimension, but it's enough to understand all the mechanisms, which are the same, um, but more dimensions. I was also showing initially the, the shape of this 1D function, but actually in practice, in real applications, we don't know the shape of the function. That's the whole point, because if we knew the shape of the function, we wouldn't, wouldn't need to optimize it. Um, okay. So the first step of the Bayesian optimization algorithm that we use uh, is to do uh, some initial samples just, just to start up the process. In this example, I'm doing the, just the minimum, which are the two samples you see in blue, um, which are completely random. The second step is to fit, is to fit the surrogate model. So I think most people who are doing Bayesian optimization, they will use a Gaussian process. Um, so in this case, I fitted the Gaussian process to our observed data points, and we only have two. So of course, so far, our Gaussian process is not very accurate, but nevertheless, we do get out of it a mean and variance across the entire space. And this is really good because we can use this Gaussian process as an emulator or as a proxy for our, our complicated loss function that I presented before. The loss function that we have, it would take approximately 10 minutes to evaluate one data point in this search space on an HPC cluster. But with this emulator, even though it's not very accurate, we can explore the entire space in a few seconds. So that's why it, it's really valuable. Um, and then we use this Gaussian process to explore the space. And to do this, we have what we call an acquisition function, which leverages the Gaussian process for the exploration. And what it does is, essentially, it optimizes this emulated um, loss function, and it will tell us where we want to explore the space. And it's a classic exploration versus, versus exploitation dilemma. Essentially, it's, it's, do we want to explore the search space where the mean, the predicted mean of the emulator is low, or do we want to explore the space where the, the uncertainty is high? Um, there are different types of acquisition function. Um, in this case, I am using the expected improvement um, and it told me to explore this point here at minus four in red, okay? Which unfortunately, unfortunately is a little bit worse than what we had, but that's okay because this is just the start. We can add, so we evaluate this point uh, on the cluster with the complex function. We now have three observed data points. And we can just iterate this whole process so we can fit our Gaussian process again. But now we have three observed data points, so it improves the quality of the Gaussian process. We run the acquisition function. It tells us to explore this point here at uh, minus one point, one point something. And yeah, we iterate again and again and again. And I will skip a few iterations. But this is what we get after about 20 or 30 iterations. Um, so this is a very simple function, but we do find the minimum of the function after about 20 or 30 iterations. Um, and you can also see on the right, you see the, the real shape of the function because this is a toy function, so we know the shape of this function. And you see that the Gaussian process was able to capture the, the shape of that function. Even though that's not our goal, our goal is to find the minimum. But that was a 1D function, okay? So let's increase the number of dimension using the same toy function to five dimensions. And what happens is um, I cannot easily plot the five-dimensional uh, function on the screen but I'm showing instead the convergence of this process over 300 evaluations, which is more than, significantly more than what I did just before. And basically what happens is there is no convergence because the space is already too large in five dimensions. So essentially what happens is the uncertainty is very high everywhere because the space is mostly unknown and the acquisition function only does exploration. It just keeps um, sampling where the uncertainty is high forever. So to counter this, we use what we call the trust region Bayesian optimization algorithm, also known as Turbo. It's a very simple algorithm. Uh, essentially how it works is if we fail to improve to find a better set of parameters three times in a row in this process, we cut the search space in half ar uh, around the best point we have so far. That's very simple. But this forces convergence. Um, 
And we do this multiple times if needed. Oops. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. So using Turbo, we have warranted convergence. Um, but we are also more likely to end up in a local minima. And this is also why we need to do a higher number of initial samples when we calibrate open malaria with Turbo. Because if we start with only two samples, there is a very high chance we will quickly um, start converging on a part of the space that we have explored and completely ignore a lot of the search space. So we need a lot more initial samples. Uh, but at least we have a convergence. And if we go back to this example in five dimension, on the left, is this is without the Turbo algorithm. On the right, this is with the Turbo algorithm. And you see a clear convergence. And we actually reach the optimal point of the function. And we can do the same with open malaria with our 23 parameters. And this also converges nicely. Uh, the first 3,000 samples you see on the left, they are the initial random samples. This is why they're all over the place. And then it quickly converges over 7,000 um, samples. Um, in addition, uh, the cool thing about the, using a Gaussian process is that Compared to other models, it's not a black box model. We can actually learn things from it, and we can look inside the, the model how it works. And in particular for the Gaussian process, uh, I am plotting here the length scales matrix of the Gaussian process, which is similar to what you would get with a sensitivity analysis. And it shows the correlation between the parameters on the x-axis and the 12 objectives that we have on the y-axis. And just as an example, we can look at the first three parameters. Uh, which regulates in open malaria the infection incidence model. And you can see that there is a high correlation with all of the um, objectives related to prevalence and incidence, which makes a lot of sense. And this is what we expect um, from the model. And this gives us a bit more confidence that what we are doing is actually correct. OK, um, all much reaching the 13 minutes. So takeaway messages, uh, we have developed this framework. Uh, it works quite well. Uh, it is used now by EMOD. This is the next talk. But we also use it as with TPH to calibrate um, this other individual based model, this Opistor KISS model. It's also used at the Dayton Kids Institute in Perth to calibrate um, intervention parameters against vaccine trials data. What I would like to say is um, the algorithm works really well, but now the new challenge is actually everything else around this, which is actually a lot. So it's not plug and play. It requires very high quality curated data. This is the most important thing so that we get a good calibration. But also the objectives must be uh, constrained enough. We need to have the to define the search space and the range of every parameter really well. And we need tools to validate the model. Even though we calibrate, uh, the model is well calibrated to our reference data, we need to check that it performs well on a whole range of tasks. For example, the plot I'm showing on the right, where we are comparing uh, edge patterns of clinical incidence for three different calibrations. You can see we get similar results, which is good, but it's also not completely identical. And there are, of course, many limitations. Um, yeah, dimensionality, computing cost and time. Um, we have some unidentifiability. Every time we do calibration, we end up in a slightly different part of the space. Even though the calibrations are comparable, um, we end up with different parameters, essentially. And of course, we can also have model limitations, uh, where the model is just simply not able to um, be calibrated well enough to some data. The framework is developed uh, with Python and Botorch, the Botorch library. Um, yeah, and that's it. If you have any question. <laughs> Maybe just um, while we load the next presentation. Um, have you thought about using latent uh, hyper hypercube sampling for parameters that typically seems to be an efficient method, but uh, you don't have to sample 10 to the power parameters. Yeah. 
I mean, we use this uh, for initial sampling to sample the whole um, hypercube initially. Um, I'm not sure what is your question then after that. Um, so basically what we do is we just sample our initial samples, com com initial samples completely randomly in the whole search space. We could use um, a previous set of parameters that we know is really good, but then this will introduce a bias towards this set of parameters. Yeah. 